what are things that make you cry? Sometimes it just happens. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'm thinking about somebody else. If I'm just being real, sometimes I'll be watching a movie. I'm just like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that hit me. Strong men also cry. I do think it's important for people to at least work through some of their problems like on their own a little bit before you go and like blabbering it to everybody. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Some women really do not like seeing a man share emotion in that way. What's with men these days? Caleb Williams, he's soft, he's a crybaby. Are you crying? It does seem like people are more open about it. It's just an interesting thing to try to figure out uh, where does this leave us? Is this a positive thing? Get back in there, Tia. <laughs> oh, I told you all that story, right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yep. that big motherfucker. It was an iPod Nano. So now you have just a closet full of everybody else's shit. <laughs> no, the iPod Nano was Nigeria. A cop took that from me. But oh, that's different. It was my Apple headphones, my little oh. iPhone earbuds. Dude, I like those. He borrowed them and never gave them back. I like those mm. more than like the the uh, the ones that go in the ear. Mm. But they just the don't AirPods? sound nowhere near as good, though. Yeah, like the wired ones. Mm. Anyway. Do you guys still fuck with in-ear earbuds? Because, like, I don't know. I haven't in a long time because I heard, like, it's... I mess with them here and there, but they, they make me they make me more nervous than the over-the-ear ones for some reason. More nervous? Why? I just think it's going to, like, fuck up my hearing. That's what I was you thinking. Know? That's what I'm thinking. And then also with the over-the-ear one, um, I don't... I don't need to have uh, the I don't need to have it as high, especially like with music. And I don't think it's good to like you just max out your volume all mm -hmm. I mean, I have no idea, but I don't think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. to max out your volume all day long. Give it a few decades. We'll see. We'll see how <laughs> everyone's doing. I know all of it could be like microwaving my brain for all I know. Oh, it's geez. supposed to. Like because of the the Bluetooth and yeah. all that shit. It's supposed to be doing something like that. The Bluetooth and the red tube and the <laughs> everything else. <laughs> All the colors mixing. Red tube was one of your favorites? Mixing together. <laughs> I heard about it once. Heard about it once. Uh, red tube's eye. Mm -hmm. Was. All right. Was. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Free porn. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking just <laughs> made everybody crazy. Do you think it's wild how much there is? One second. Let, <laughs> let, let, me, let me just Let's do some research. Much. Let's just check the old web, bread, web browser. <laughs> <laughs> might want to wipe it clean okay while it's difficult to, difficult to estimate how much porn content is available on the internet there are several widely varying estimates available according to an estimate there are at least four million adult websites on the net which is 12 percent of all websites damn huh, and then also uh yeah, and then also like instagram's probably 80 percent porn <laughs> right you know what i mean i'm probably getting old saying that but ig's a gateway for sure yeah Same yeah there's TikTok. a lot of a lot of boobies and other things on there, mm -hmm. you know? TikTok's way worse, though. Because TikTok, you God, have like I the, can't imagine. That's uh, got to be exciting. It's got to be better than the Sears catalog back in the day. Yeah. Looking at women in like a, a brassiere. <laughs> <laughs> they had the... Uh, like full coverage, you know, yeah. full coverage everywhere. Just a little cleavage. And you're like, yes, this is awesome. And, and they and was, like in big underwear. Big, <laughs> big underwear. And they were like really like cone shaped, yeah. too. They were like very, very padded. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the oh yeah. The bra was yeah. Uh huh. Odd shape. <laughs> yeah. Like fucking torpedo coming out. Of you. <laughs> yeah. you know, I was thinking the other day. This That's is true. Really... <laughs> That's so true. Like a fem, like a fembot. <laughs> I was thinking this the other day. <laughs> I, I think it's it's super convenient that like your dick doesn't get wet. <laughs> it's very convenient. Imagine if your dick got wet. Oh, that would got. just suck. What like, do you mean? Like if like when you got hard when you got excited. If it also got like wet. <laughs> well, some guys have like preemies. You know yeah. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little, like, yeah. little, little spurt here. But like every time you every got erect, if it would just be <laughs> like the whole, shooting. like if, if, we, if we were like women, like the whole front of our pants would be wet all the time. All the time. <laughs> so, oh, that would be, that would be horrible. Be like, Even, oh my God. And you'd be like, no, I peed my pants. I swear. <laughs> Even these days, man. Even, Even these days, that'd be bad. I still wear tight shit, tight boxers. Try to hold it down. Just so, you know. You never know. Yeah. Yeah, you never know. Wind picks up the wrong way or the right way. Mm. <laughs> and there you go. Yeah. I'm, st I'm still an easily excited gentleman, mm. but I'll never show it. You'll never know. Could just be hiding one. You can't tell. Hiding mm. a boner? Yeah, yeah. You can't tell for multiple reasons, but at the mm. same time, you'll never know. Mm. <laughs> Keep it a secret. <laughs> I had a, let me. Yep. Here we go. God. <laughs> Why does it look like that?
Yeah, right? The pointy bra. Uh-huh. There's triangles everywhere. I don't know. Maybe that does something underneath clothes to... Maybe. To accentuate the... This is all we well, said. In this like worked. the 60s and 70s, like the... Yeah, woman's like boobs would would be like pointy looking. Mm. <laughs> Wait, you mean the brow or like all the, all the, well, yeah. <laughs> all the women back in the then? Somebody's head. <laughs> That'd be interesting. No, I think I think the bra was like pointy. Yeah, and then so I think you know it just it looked pointy. It looked mm. like their yeah. titties were pointy. <laughs> Andrew knows what I'm talking about. I love that. Just like we will, like leave we will never ever whatever. grow up. But yeah, I yeah. know exactly what you're talking about yeah like the main woman on the show like her mm-hmm. boobs looked pointy Very pointy yeah mm. like a madonna type thing yeah maybe it's just because everything was like clean and pressed back then so yeah, no, boobs are fascinating <laughs> they really are i think it was rogan he does like a whole bit about like you have great new york boobs <laughs> he says that, that, that was Chappelle. yeah but it was rogan mm. yeah that was rogan <laughs> He does a whole bit about like cleavage and then he's like, imagine like the male equivalent. He's like, imagine if we had uh, like a window on our pants that just showed your nuts. (laughs) He's like, it like holds the dick off to the side maybe a little bit, but the balls are like jammed together and it's like a little clear window into the, into the balls that you get to see that you pretend that you're not looking at when you talk to somebody. You're like, eyes are, you know, gleaming downward Mm -hmm. as you're talking to somebody. You're like, hey, nice ball cleavage. Yeah. On a side note, it's so interesting. <laughs> so, no, no, it, I, I do find it so interesting how um, some women really like balls. And I, I can understand if a woman likes men that maybe she likes balls. But I look at my balls, I'm just like, ew. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, why would you ever like this hairy sex? Yeah, women are foul. <laughs> yeah. They are, they're gross. Like, I could understand women liking other women's breasts because they're beautiful. You know, the, they're, they're wonderful things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but balls are just... <laughs> they're they're always in this boxers and they they collect sweat well, and their guys' hairy. mindset. You're like, I'll eat every single thing that that girl has. Like, I'll eat the whole <laughs> yeah. the whole pa- I'll eat the whole thing, the whole package before workout, after workout. Doesn't uh, matter. Hundred yeah. percent. Don't it, shower. <laughs> but there's girls that think, yeah, there's girls that get excited about the same thing, and you're like, no, no you shouldn't do that with me. Like, That's I'm true. really disgusting. You know, don't ever think <laughs> yeah. that about me. Like. Maybe thinking about another person might be fine, but yeah, I'm not the right person for that. <laughs> That's right. You're right. I'm, I'm holding a double standard. That's yeah. not okay. That's okay. Exactly. What's our topic for today? We have something? You write we something down, something. Andrew? We got something. You so got the we, script? The script. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we can start with, uh, what was the quarterback's name? I already forgot. He's on the couch. Oh, this is the quarterback for uh, USC. He's uh, He won the Heisman Trophy last year. I don't remember his name either. Caleb Williams. There you go. He's on all the commercials and stuff. Yeah, he's famous. When and where is it acceptable for a man to cry? Because from what I understood, grown men had some pride and dignity, right? So tell me why USC quarterback and Heisman winner Caleb Williams felt compelled to run to his mommy in the stands and bawl his eyes out. This lasted for at least a full minute. And then it gets even better because RG3 had the audacity to tweet out this. Any NFL team would be lucky to have him as their quarterback. And this emotion shows how much this game means to him. I totally disagree with this. An NFL team needs a leader. Not running to his mommy, ball his eyes out and creating a spectacle for the cameras. Oh, and then after the game in the post-game presser, Williams said that I want to go home and cuddle with my dog and watch some shows. What's with men these days? How is this deemed acceptable in their minds? Caleb Williams, he's soft, he's a crybaby, and I implore mm. any NFL scouts to keep this pathetic scene in mind when concocting their idea of what a leader on an NFL team looks like. When and where is it? A- hmm. She's a little harsh. Yeah. She does not like a man who, who sheds tears in front yeah. of people. She said, I thought men had pride and dignity. Damn. He kept Damn. running back to his mommy. Wow. She said he's soft. Yeah, yeah oh. very soft. That's not very nice. No. You know, the, the funny thing is like the, uh, if, if a woman said stuff like this, or if a man said stuff like mm. this, the immediate thing that oh. women will say is, who hurt you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the thing I want to tell ask her is like, who hurt you? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Yeah, she's all over it. Uh, but it is interesting. Like, you know, when do you kind of like let loose? I'm, I don't think he, I mean, who the hell knows? I don't think he had any control over what happened there. It didn't seem like, seemed like he ran over to his mom. He saw his mom in the stands, jumped up there, and it just seemed like he ended up having a moment. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know the story. I don't know exactly what happened or what's going on. 
Uh, I don't think it's great to just be crying on TV, especially like when you're in a position like he's in and he's going to get drafted next year and there's like a lot to consider. But I'm sure that none of that was in his head. Mm. He probably uh, had a rough game. They just lost. His mom was there. He's probably grateful for the support and probably just had some sort of moment that none of us could really, we don't really know exactly what he had going on. He probably just lost it a bit. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny, like, I wasn't even really considering that part of it, but, like, seeing his mother probably, I mean, who wouldn't, like, feel something in that moment? Um, And I'm thinking about this because there was a post, uh, it was just like, because, you know, you start following some parent accounts and it starts getting into your feed. And there were, this is a little kid, so this is way different, but she was, like, doing some kind of performance. She's looking around the crowd. She doesn't see her parents. And then finally, like, you know, as she looks towards the camera, she sees her parents and she starts crying. And she gets full of so much emotion because she's so happy. But so, like, I'm thinking maybe in that moment there's a little bit of that. But at the same time, like, you know, depending on (laughs) what team is projected to potentially draft him, you know, if I'm that team, I'm like, hmm, like, wait a second. Like, is is there more here? Like, is there? do we need to dig deeper into, like, what's going on here emotionally? Like, if he can't handle this, what else can't he handle? Well, let me ask you, when when you say that, what do you mean can't handle? So do you think in that situation – what are you saying exactly? No, I'm just saying in general, like, uh, you don't want somebody that's not very stable in all situations, like, especially at the quarterback position. Um, I'll just, this may be not quite the, the perfect story for it, but when uh, Peyton Manning was interviewed by the Colts, uh, they were like, hey, what are you going to do as soon as you get drafted? And he's like, I'm going to go learn the playbook. And then uh, they interviewed Ryan Leaf. And they were like, hey, what are you going to do when you get drafted? He's like, oh, I'm going to take my boys and we're going to go celebrate getting drafted. They're like, oh, cool. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Ryan Leaf ended up being one of the biggest busts in all of NFL history mm-hmm. off of like this one little question. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, and again, I'm, I know that's like not like too relevant to what we're talking about here, but you want somebody that's going to be there physically and mentally for your team. And if this guy's supposed to be the guy, it might be, you know, something that you look at now. I don't know for sure if it's enough to actually like dig in and look at it, but I think it'll be something. And the thing is, though, it'll take one really good play to, for all of this to get washed away. A hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> that's all it's gonna take. All right, while y'all are listening, I want you. I want you to comment down below, uh, guys crying or, or or dudes crying. And even this situation, is it? Is it a show that men are becoming softer and weaker? Are you gonna Elliot Hulse this shit, or uh, is there times when it's okay? curious what you guys think so comment that down below but when it when it comes to this type of shit i mean let me ask me ask both you guys both you guys this what are things that make you cry if you ever do what and and yeah what are things that make you Mm -hmm. cry? i think that's a tough thing is that like i again i think in this situation i don't think he was like thinking about anything he ran to his mom and probably jumped up there and just had a moment that's the weird thing about crying sometimes like i can talk about my brother's death or my mother's death a lot of times and mm-hmm. it'd be totally fine uh sometimes uh you know i might run into somebody a fan or something or or a friend of my brother's i might even just see a friend of my brother's like an old friend of old family friend of my brother's and i might just start to cry mm-hmm. like that might <clears throat> bring out emotion and, and it's almost like I'm thinking about how hurt he is because he was friends with my brother, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't really know exactly like uh, the direct like mechanism of of, of what something is that's going to make me cry. But sometimes it just happens. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'm thinking about somebody else. It's not even my own shit that I'm going through. I'm just thinking about, um, man, like that must really hurt that person. That sucks. That will that will cause me to tear up pretty Mm -hmm. quickly. Okay, that's I mean, I don't that doesn't sound weak or unacceptable. Right. Uh, Andrew, how about you? Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't know, like kind of on a, like a more lighter note, but like you see those videos when like somebody's coming back from like a, a stint overseas in the army and mm. like they surprise their kid or something. The kid starts bawling. I'm like right there with them. And it's just like, oh my God. They always do it in some like big setup way and shit. Yeah. yeah I'm a sucker for some of that. Too. Yeah. Stuff like that. Or even like... um I don't hear about like a, a a certain team like winning a championship and like kind of understanding their story and stuff like that. Like, 
you get super pumped for people. So like I get, you know, I'll get a little like teary eyed for stuff like that every now and again. But um, Andrew, can you play this yeah. video I'm about to send you, please? <laughs> yeah. uh, what you just said reminds me of this. I remember we pulled it up on a podcast once, and I couldn't help but fucking laugh. I just sent it to you in the chat, please. There's also crying uh, <laughs> from just being like joyful, being happy. Yeah, you know, sometimes you cry because you're fucking excited about something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh fuck, this guy's great. Oh, by yeah. the way. Uh, now, I'll tell you when I do cry, but when you see like one of those kids with Down syndrome oh my God, high school basketball right. game, starts nailing threes and the gym goes crazy, bro, I'll be crying. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> when you said the fucking like, oh yeah, when a military <laughs> person comes back, I just yeah. like. <laughs> Me, I thought of this guy. I only, I only cry when I see those kids with Down syndrome, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was so specific. <laughs> so specific. Dude, but, but it, it is interesting because I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal it's a very different thing if like you're a person who is crying like all the time everything gets you down mm -hmm. you do that in front of other people all the time right it's it, it, it's kind of different than if something hits you like i mean if i'm if i'm just being real sometimes i'll be watching a movie and something mm -hmm. really nice happens i'm just like oh <laughs> oh, that hit me. Yeah. There's this fucking anime. It's called. I'm Me. not crying. Yeah, there's a fucking anime called One Piece, and this guy Chiro Oda who wrote it. it it's like th there's thousands of chapters, right? Mm -hmm. So this guy's written a big story. He has a bunch of like <laughs> characters with dark past and shit. And multiple times there will be stories of just like horrible things, and just oh my god, that hits. Like mm -hmm. you know, a good story with a good like that shit will make a person oh, cry. And yeah. I don't think there's any type of weakness if like whoa. You feel something when right. you cry, right? So when this woman's going on about this guy going up to his mommy, she had to call it mommy. Mm -hmm. Who knows what the fuck happened? Maybe he hasn't seen his mom in a long ass time. Maybe she just went through some shit, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and Maybe the they dedicated the game to like a family member that died or something. Yeah. And then going back home to his dogs and, and enjoying something. And that that's, mm -hmm. why, yeah. why is that so... <laughs> Why Sounds is that like a so good bad? idea. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I don't have to cuddle up with my dogs. Well, the game's also <laughs> over, too. Yeah. Right? So it's not like it, it wasn't halftime mm -hmm. where he saw his mom and then cried and then continued to lose the game. You know, like, <laughs> might be a different conversation. He'd be like, man, in the <laughs> yeah. second half, he came that out super true. flat. He was crying with his mama on the sidelines, mm -hmm. and then he just sucked the whole game. It, the game was over, you know, and it's like, we don't really... Uh, there's people celebrating. There's people running off the field, you know, uh, putting their hand over their head, screaming, yelling, all pumped up. Hap they're happy, you know. So what's really the big difference between someone being happy versus someone crying? All right, but let me ask you this, Mark, because I remember, you were, I think Eric mentioned something one day. I don't know yeah. if he just saw a video and you were like, what is it with all these dudes talking about crying? Yeah. <laughs> so you do, what? there's something you notice. What is it mm -hmm. that you meant when you said that? Well, that's a little different. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, Eric was talking about the podcast with Chris Williamson and Chris Bumstead. And Eric was like, I love the fact that he was like so open and this and that. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, I love the fact that he talked about crying. Mm -hmm. And then Owen or someone else chimed in and all these guys are like of similar age. And I was like, what's with you guys and all this crying? What the fuck's <laughs> going on around here? So while that video is interesting and like the woman's, you know, pointing out the guys crying after the game or whatever, um, I think she is mentioning something that probably a lot of people have noticed is that maybe men are crying more or maybe they're just sharing their emotions more. Maybe men didn't used to talk about it as much. Mm. Um, social media is a really weird thing because, you know, like you're tr trying to share stuff with people and then you might try to share the fact that you had a rough day and that you deal with depression or you deal with sadness but a lot of other people do that too. And so are you trying just to get likes for that? Or, or are mm. you someone that really mm. does have some cloudy days and you really have overcame those things? Or are you just trying to placate into this um, day and age of like you're able to get likes, sympathy, people comment, oh man, you got this bro, or like mm. whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the uh, kind of outcry is for some of the stuff. So it does seem like... Uh, it does seem like people are more open about it. It's just an interesting thing to try to figure out uh, where does this leave us? Is this a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? I don't really know. I don't think suppressing your feelings all the time is a good idea. Um, but also I don't think just letting your feelings run, run you rampant and, yeah. and drag you around um, like you're, you're getting dragged around by a horse or something like that. Like, I don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I do think it's good for men to start to, um, men and women to start to learn uh, some sort of emotional maturity, not to like stuff things down and not to just, you know, be cold and all that kind of stuff, but just to sit on your feelings for a second and like sit with them and just, you know, let, let, let yourself, allow yourself to maybe think about them a little bit, allow yourself to start to, um, cause you don't want to, I think the main thing about a feeling is that I think that you, um, you don't want to overreact to a feeling, whether it be good or bad. Sometimes you do have to react if it's a sport or something like that. But even within a sport, most people will say, and in something like war, um, you want people to have a skill set mm. to rely on that overrides whatever feeling you may have. I'm sure in the military, they don't want to execute some of the things that they have to execute, but they do them because it's part of a safety protocol. It's part of a team and they just do it. And uh, they probably have their feelings later. And that could be something that leads to uh, PTSD and some other things that happen uh, down the road from that. Pat Project family, we love beef on this podcast. We talk about it a lot. All right. We love our meat. But sometimes eating the same meat all the time can get a little bit boring. That's why we partnered with Good Life Proteins, which also has certified Piedmontese on their website. But sometimes you might just want to eat some chicken or fish or duck. <laughs> duck. Who eats duck? But you can eat duck. That's why if you go to goodlifeproteins.com, you can select their Build-A-Box options and input all the proteins you want. Then you'll select subscribe and save to save money on all of your meat. If you enter code POWERPROJECT at checkout, you can save up to 25% on your subscription. That means you're going to be saving 25% on all of that different meat that's going to be heading to your door. Once again, head to goodlifeproteins.com. You can enter code POWERPROJECT and save up to 25%. Links are in the description box below as well as the podcast show notes. The the thing about the like this lady right here and many women too, and you'll hear a lot of guys talk about this. Uh, some women really do not like seeing a man share emotion in that way um there have been guys and there's a video we want to pull up but there there are guys that talk about how you know when when a man does that automatically her pussy dries up mm -hmm. you know like women <laughs> hate that and i think part of the reason why like sometimes a guy could overdo it with like the crying and the sorrow and the sharing of his problems and his woes where it could end up being something very negative in the relationship but there are some women who feel that a man needs to be superman like I, I, why, why are you being a little bitch? Mm -hmm. And that partially just could be because maybe if she had a father in her life, maybe her father never showed anything too. Cause that's something that you kind of, mm -hmm. you see it from like older generation of guys. Mm -hmm. Like we don't share that shit. We don't like, if they have a son, why the fuck are you crying? Like, <laughs> Buck up, man up kid. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So if a girl sees that from her dad, then like the man she wants to be with, he better not be, crying or or showing that shit because that means you're you're a weak dude right it, it <laughs> seems like there there, there just yeah. does need to be a middle ground too because we're human like men are human too mm -hmm. you know and I, I i can understand like i've seen michael hearn post some stuff about this i see a lot of this stuff from elliot hulse i can understand uh, having a level of emotional regularity having control over your emotions as a man but then on the other side of things not allowing yourself to feel certain things or stuffing certain things down uh, and and not sharing it at all or it, 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 it just holding it to yourself doesn't seem to be healthy as a human being because you're a human with all those emotions. Right. It's kind of unfair to say you, you, you can't show that right. ever. Probably a time and place. I think uh, having, again, having some maturity with it, being able to like pause on it, be able to think about it a little bit more before you express exactly what's going on obviously like if you feel like you're in some real danger then it's important to communicate with somebody but i think um if you can if you can buy yourself some time and communicate with somebody about it and say i don't really know what's going on but like this situation i've i've been trying to do a bunch of different things and it actually is breaking my heart it's making me really sad I don't think there's anything wrong with like talking that way. And that might even just bringing that up and even saying that that way might make you cry. Um, but you might also had an opportunity to think about it enough to where crying isn't really part of it anymore. Cause maybe you already were doing that. Maybe you're already kind of like working, working those things out. I do think it's important for people to 
at least work through some of their problems like on their own a little bit before you go and like blabbering it to everybody. Because I think it's important for you to be able to, in a relationship, it's different. You know, um, if it's with your mom, it might be different. But I think for the most part, I think that you should try to work through your problems a little bit so you can make better sense, so you can communicate better. If you think about like a little kid when they're really crying and they try to go to their parent, they can't even talk. They're like, <gasps> and they're trying to explain that their brother hit them with a truck or something like that or in the back of the head. And they, they can't get the word. And you're like, okay, slow down and calm down. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to get the uh, information out. So I think... You know, being able to have some sort of uh, like mental and emotional maturity with it, I think can be really important. Yeah, I, I, I like wanted to um, to point out like, so with my dad, zero emotion. So when it came to me trying to handle my emotion, I didn't know what the fuck, like I didn't know what, what I was doing. And I, I read something, I don't know who wrote it, but, and it's kind of like how I, like why I'm trying to, um, to like how you said, like work through the emotions a little bit better. Um, it was something like, um, don't let the cloud over your head get your kids wet. And I was like, whoa, it's like, that's deep, you know? So like whatever the heck I'm trying to work through, I want to do it in a positive way, you know? So that way it's like, it doesn't get dumped on to my son. I'm not saying the way it did from my dad to me, but like, you know, I could tell that my dad would be depressed, but he would never admit it. You know, he never, ever dealt with it. And I remember reading that it, it can be like a generational thing. Like if you don't take care of whatever you're working on, you can pass it down. So like I'm trying to make sure I'm not passing any of that weight down to my son. Mm-hmm. So like trying to learn to, you know, do things almost in a positive way of trying to, I don't want to say trauma because, you know, whatever. Like it, it doesn't take a traumatic thing to happen for me to like kind of feel like I'm down. But at the same time, like whatever that is that sparked it, like I need to figure out how to work through that so I don't, you know, pass it over to my son for him to try to figure out one day. Your mm-hmm. son's sitting on your lap and you're like, well, son, I'm super <laughs> sad today. I'm not where I want to be in my life. And your son just looks at you and blinks a couple times and goes, dad, bink, stop bink. being such a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why is my daddy such a bitch? Yeah. He was like, I was hanging out with grandpa the other yeah. day and he said, you're a little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 but real talk, I have a question for you, man. What's up? Um, you said your dad never really showed anything, and mm-hmm. some people may look at that as a level of strength. Uh, let, let me ask you, do you do you think that and I, okay, I I don't want this to sound like cuz whenever people mention things about their parents, some people are like, "Oh, everybody blames their parents." Mm-hmm. But the thing is you got to think about like you learn if from you, you learn from your parents. <laughs> like they're the closest thing to you for oh, most yeah. people. Mm-hmm. So you will learn to model certain things that your parents do. Now as you became an adult, did you find that you modeled any of that and was that for you do you think a positive or was it a negative that you had to tr- are you trying to work out currently? Yeah, I'm still working through it, but I mean, we've, I've jokingly said, like, I don't, I don't like kids and, you know, I have two kids and I love my kids, but Mm -hmm. like, I don't like kids. Um, so that's been a super big negative thing for me. Like when my son was born, it it was like really difficult for me to hold him just because I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm going to break him. I know everybody kind of feels that way, Yeah. but people feel that way and they still will, you know, hold their, their nieces and nephews and stuff. I never did. I always rent like wait till you're older and then we'll hang out or yeah, something. I'm not holding a three week old. Nope. Yeah. So stuff like that, where it's like, wow, like I probably could have got some reps in before I got to my son, you know, like that would have been kind of nice. Mm-hmm. Like that's cool. And then, um, so that's one thing where I feel like it did have a negative thing. And then the other negative that turned into a positive is like, we never told each other that we loved each other like ever. Mm-hmm. And now with my son and my daughter and now my wife, we say it every day, like yeah. several times a day. Like we can't like see each other without saying it. And growing up, we never said it. And I knew we did, but it's just like we never said it. So so it's like kind of two, we'll say negative things that are kind of turning around to try to be a, a more positive thing. And uh, the first one being like recognizing like, oh, shit, like I, I missed an opportunity to, you know, get some reps in. Mm-hmm. And then the second one, like, oh, I'm not going to miss an opportunity to tell them that I love them. Mm-hmm. I definitely saw emotions in my house. Um, crying, like, mm, not a ton. Mm. I didn't see a lot of crying, but um, I'd see my dad get mad, you know? I'd see him get mad. I'd see my mom would get frustrated with us here and there, you know, having three boys and just having us, like, break <laughs> stuff and eat all the food all the time and stuff. I've seen her, you know, she would get mad. Um, 
I've seen my dad be angry and then like do something. You know, I've seen him angry and like punch something or throw your Nintendo out the window, throw something, you know, like, yeah. And so those are things that are hard to detach when you're a kid. Not that my, my dad was never, he was never like violent or anything. Um, But, you know, he, he would get, he would, he would get mad to the point where um, in my opinion, he'd like overreact. And I don't, I don't think that having your emotions lead to that is a good is a good thing. I think that's a I I think that's a a negative in most cases. Um so even something like crying, I don't think there's anything wrong with crying. Um I think there could be something wrong with uh crying and being super upset and then like the the aftermath of that. Like what are you going to do next? Mm. So you cry cuz you're super upset about something and then now are you on the couch like drinking, you know, and getting drunk and like trying to deal with it that way? Mm-hmm. Uh, or did you just cry and you fucking wipe off the tears and you go outside and you go for a walk? You know, I think, I think what you do with those emotions and then, uh, you know, trying to explain them to children can be really, can be difficult sometimes. Cause like, why are you crying? It's like, unless someone died, it's kind of complicated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it can be kind of complicated to explain it sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's odd for it to just be constantly looked at as a, as weakness, right? Um, I think anger can be weakness too. A hundred percent, hundred percent, especially for a, a lot of guys. Like that's one thing where you, again, it's okay if you feel angry, but what are your actions that you're taking from there? Are you punching walls and yelling at people? I'd rather see someone cry than see him to be mad. Cause I think a lot of times when you're mad, especially a, a guy, when a guy seems to get mad, it's, they seem to have a real hard time calming down and coming back from that where I've seen plenty of people come back from crying because they cry and then they let it out and they're like mm-hmm. maybe they're a little embarrassed you know like fuck all right <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of back to normal but everybody knows that everyone cries um I do think that it's uh I think it's dumb I think it's just flat out dumb and stupid to have stuff that you don't talk about um you know sometimes somebody will say something like uh oh you know he, he don't talk to your dad about that. He's like uh, super religious or something like something about like sex or something. And it's like, I'm so confused right now. Why, why are those two things gelled together that way? People that are religious don't have sex. Mm -hmm. Like what, what's the connection there? Like that's really odd. Not until you're married. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not until you're married, which is fine, but still doesn't mean you can't talk, you know, you still probably have some sort of conversation about it. Um, so I think, you know, just being stubborn and not being like open or open-minded to having conversation, um, I think is really detrimental. I think communicating with your kids as they're growing up, uh, every time they have an emotion, especially the stronger the emotion, the better the opportunity for education. It's like, this is a, this is a learning opportunity right here. Um, my kid is crying and they're really upset because their friend, you know, broke their video game thing or whatever. This is a great opportunity to have a conversation. This is a great opportunity to say, Hey, you know, these things happen and explain it whatever way uh, you need to. And even just uh, situations that might happen where your kid feels left out, your kid feels, um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff kids can feel, but being left out is probably one of the bigger ones that especially like younger, younger kids will feel. But Working them through those emotions and communicating with them, I think, will help them when they're adults. Mm-hmm. Um, before we move on any further, as, in regards to Caleb Williams, um, like, because I'm just thinking, like, he's not the first athlete on a big stage that cried after a loss, but for some reason, he did get a lot of attention. I'm not sure why, like, because I'm, I'm thinking, um, even, well, I guess that was a win, but when uh, Vernon Davis uh, scored a game winning touchdown, mm-hmm. He took his helmet off and he just like, like he cried kind of like red on Friday. He's just like waddling to his coach and he's crying, like just full on ugly crying. And everybody was kind of, they were cool with that. I'm curious, Mark, why do you think people made such a big deal out of Caleb Williams this time? I just think they're not used to seeing that. Like right after the game, he ran, ran up into the stands to his mom. He's still like not all the way in the stands, you know, <laughs> yeah. he's like sitting on the fence there and he's crying with his mom and his I think his mom shielded him like his mom like Mm -hmm. blocked their faces so you couldn't see 
And it was very clear by like the way he was moving that he was not only was he crying, but it seemed like it was like a really like deep emotional cry. So Mm -hmm. I think that we're used to seeing athletes like when they win, they'll cry Um, sometimes post game interview Mm -hmm. and they lost maybe like a little like, man, I'm super upset. You know, Mm -hmm. we tried to tried so hard for this team and. I'm disappointed in myself and uh, I let, I let my coaches down, I let my team down. You see that sometimes and you're like, oh, it's all like understandable, but his situation where he, you know, kind of jumped up into the crowd uh, with his mom. I don't, I can't remember ever really seeing that before where an athlete was with like their parent Got it. and they were crying. Like um, it just makes you think of like a schoolyard situation where like the kid ran home and ran to his mom. Um, but I, again, I don't think, I don't really th- I mean, I don't think that guy's weak. <laughs> I don't. I don't think he's. Uh, I mean, I think he's a he's a hell of an athlete. Um, and who the hell knows? Um, I remember, you know, just like having having a parent at a sporting event is really powerful for some reason. I don't know. I don't know what it does. I don't know why. Like, or having your parents at any sort of performance that you have. Yeah. I mean, I remember after I did a bench, uh, I think I benched 854 and I got off the bench and I was kind of pissed. I was like pretty pissed because I just locked the weight out. I'm holding the weight at lockout forever. And I don't know if it's, if you couldn't hear the guy say the rack command or I don't know what happened, but he's saying rack and that's usually signifies that the lift is over and it's a good lift. And then people help you back to the rack but like no one could hear him or he called it late or something. So I'm holding this weight up there forever. And I feel like I'm going to fucking die. I make the lift and I get up off the bench and I'm purple (laughs) and gray. And, uh, I'm like, you know, walk into the back and I'm, I'm like, I mean, I'm so mad if someone was like in my way, I felt like I could have fucking just knocked them out. Cause I just, I was frustrated, you know, for, for a moment. And I don't, that normally doesn't ever happen to me, but my mom, I walked, the first person I walked past was my mom and she like grabbed my forearm. She goes, good job, honey. <laughs> I just went whoosh. Like in that moment, I could have just probably bawled, but I, I was still kind of like walking or whatever, but that just kind of like, whoosh, just took everything out. Yeah. I think also just like the one thing is, I think we all have in our minds, what we have is like an ideal man mm. or the ideal man that we want to be but there's also a there's a big spectrum of like w- how much emotion certain guys have versus others how much they're willing to show versus others and it's it's a bit ridiculous to think that all men should be like this mm. because like not all women are one way either so let's say that because caleb i just found something that he said that's just simply who i am that was raw emotion being human being myself someone that cares about this team these guys and winning especially right so he he is a self-admitted kind of emotional guy and there's going to be some woman or many women who like that aspect of him but i mean i know for myself like there are certain things that will make me feel things, but I'm not generally an emotional person. I don't ever have outbursts. I really don't show when I'm angry. Um, so it's just it's just different. Doesn't mean it's better. Doesn't mean it's ideal. And doesn't mean it's it's better to women too. Because like a lot of times when you see guys talk about this, it's in relation to how women will view you, mm. right? Like there, there's this video that we'll pull up from this Hamza guy or whatever, but. You know, one of the things that's mentioned is like, oh, women will view you as weaker, right? Well, a subtype of women will view you as weaker. Mm. Doesn't mean every type of woman. And and if if a woman views you as weak for, uh, let's say that it was, it wasn't oversharing or over emotion, but it was some sharing and some emotion. If if she views you as weak, uh, that 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 should kind of maybe be a red flag. Maybe you're a red flag for her because you share a little bit of emotion, but maybe she's a red flag for you because she cannot handle any type of emotion from a human man. <laughs> like you're supposed to be strong, stoic, and and rigid all the time. Ah, uh, maybe maybe I need to get away from this. Mm-hmm. Right, that's something to be careful of. Do you guys watch Shark Tank? Uh, used to. I'm a huge fan of Shark Tank. I've been watching it forever. I think I've seen every episode, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't think it's that's possible. There's so many episodes, but um, the show gets real when they when the people cry a lot of times. You know, they they're going back and forth. They're like, "What are your sales like?" And they're like, "Yeah, we sold ten thousand units last month." And they're like, "Oh, that's great." They go over the numbers, 
They say, what made you come up with this idea? Mm-hmm. And then here come the waterworks. Mm-hmm. You know, like my parents are immigrants and they barely made it and they provided a life for me and they have this story. And they, when someone's sharing their life story and sharing the, uh, the difficulty that the whole family went through to get them to this point, uh, they're going to be like super emotional. And I think you see like a lot of uh, speeches or motivational speeches. Um, someone's like really trying to get somebody charged up when they cry a little bit, it pulls a little extra out of you. You start to hear that real life, real person emotion. It's not just the person just talking, like you got to get out there and you got to be, it's different if the person's crying. They're like, man, you know, it was hard for me. And if they start getting choked up and they stop and they have to, they, they're crying so much, they need to like, you know, take a moment like Jordan Peterson. You see that a lot with him. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it just pulls you in a little bit. I mean, for some people it might be a deterrent, but for me, I'm usually like listening a little bit more. I'm like, oh shit, like this guy's, this guy really, you know, and maybe, uh, maybe it's a ploy, you know, maybe the guy's trying, maybe the person's trying to get you uh, more into what they're saying, but it works. It makes a difference. And I'm not here to change anybody, but you, you should maybe ask, think about this. If, if maybe like, let's say it's a Peterson thing, you see the guy, cry a little bit because he's thinking of something somebody told him or his cats right (laughs) if he if it immediately makes you like uncomfortable um maybe ask yourself why why Mm -hmm. does that make you so uncomfortable because i mean if again there are ways to overdo these emotions right where it's like yo dog chill (laughs) chill all right but if, if just in general some of that just makes you immediately uncomfortable maybe it's a you thing not not this other person's problem because they shed a few tears right Mm -hmm. so that's something, something to think about. Yeah, why are you so worried about it, bro? <laughs> Power Project family, foot health is something that we talked about all the time on the podcast, and that's why we love Vivo Barefoot Shoes. But we love them not just because they are flat, flexible, and wide, but also they don't look bad. They look actually really, really good. These are their new boots. These are their Modus trainers for in the gym. These are some of their casual shoes. But when you look at a lot of barefoot shoes, some people get turned off because... They don't want to wear those shoes outside. <laughs> and that's understandable. That's very understandable. But with Vivo, these shoes look so good and they're so good for your feet that they're almost a no-brainer. So, well, they are a no-brainer. <laughs> Andrew, how can they get some of these kicks? Yes, yeah, so you guys got to head over to vivobarefoot.com slash power project and you guys will receive 15% off your order. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash power project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. But th- th- this was interesting. He looks so comfortable all the time. That, that, it's that fucking mm. thing he wears. His new uh, YouTube channel is called Cult Leader Hamza, <laughs> right? Just went for it. Just went for it, yeah. To me. And he said, he thought I was wrong about the fact that I always tell you to not be vulnerable and show bad emotions to your woman. He said he thought I was wrong for this. And then he told me his story where he defied what I said. He <laughs> opened up, became more vulnerable and sexual attraction diminished. He started oh. acting feminine. She started acting more masculine and their relationship ended. He was confused even to this moment, even after having that experience, asking me why this is happening. And even now he couldn't truly believe that you shouldn't be vulnerable in front of a woman and you know what i said to him of course you don't believe me when i tell you to not show emotions bad emotions weakness to your woman because everyone else is disagreeing every movie all the news every dickhead on twitter all of your friends your family everyone is doing it wrong and they're telling you to do exactly like them they're telling you to treat your partner your wife your woman like your buddy like your male friend they're telling you to burden her with your troubles when she will consciously say that that's really nice you know wow well she'll seem happy about it <laughs> Should have paused it with the cat ears. <laughs> yeah, um, that was great. I would say that I think in a healthy relationship, and people can disagree with this, but I think that um, I think it's a good idea for both people not to trouble each other with each other's burdens and to work through them a little bit on your own again uh, until you start, to, until you like recognize that this, because if you go to them every single time, it's going to wear, it's going to wear away at somebody. Mm-hmm. If so, if you go to them every single time, I mean, maybe in particular, maybe someone does have like a particular problem that, that keeps coming up. I'm not really talking about that. I'm just talking about like little stuff. Like if you burden your spouse or burden your significant other all the time, every day with something that you're sad about or upset about, or I I just think that's a lot. I think that's a lot to ask. And I I think that you might end up in a relationship that's a little like one-sided 
because you you keep just taxing the fuck out of that person. So mm-hmm. I, I I think my my wife does a lot of that. You know, she doesn't always. We don't always tell each other what the kids tell us. Sometimes it's private. You know, sometimes Jake will share something with me that he won't share with his mother, and vice versa. Same thing with Quinn. Um, but if something's going to be like a bigger problem, you know, I might even say to Jake, like, hey, let's just, we'll keep that between you and I for now. But like, if this becomes a bigger thing, then we'll all have to discuss it further, you know, and yeah. kind of go from there. So I think you just, I got to be careful with like trying to burden somebody with every little tiny thing that happens. I think it's really dope uh, that you said that because uh, some some guys may look at themselves and tell themselves, I am the rock. I should be able to handle everything. And men and women, like if, if the person you're with, the woman you're with is constantly telling you everything she has to deal with, it might feel good that like you have, you feel that someone's open up and they depend on you so much, but if they depend on you for everything and if everything comes to you, now they're just another burden, right? They're not, it, it, what you're saying is if you're in a relationship as adults, be adults, right? You have issues mm-hmm. doesn't mean you can't go to that person with it, but man and woman toggle through it a little bit. You, you cause you're an adult now you can be able to deal with some of these things and then go to your significant other. Some with the, some, sometimes it's like the littlest thing. Like I might ask my wife to grab me something while I'm sitting down. I'm like, get up and get it yourself. <laughs> like, honestly, dude, like fucking get up and get it. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, she does it to me. I do it to her. Like we do it a little, a little bit, but it's like, she seems to have plenty on her plate, you know? She doesn't seem to need to add anything else. Just get off your ass and get it. Mm-hmm. Could be just even the smallest shit like that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there's there's another part to this. You are. And you're like a little bitch who thinks about her while she's thinking about work. Fair enough. But usually those <laughs> kinds of relationships end in resentment. The reason why not to show vulnerability to your girlfriend is because if she is a feminine woman, which you probably do want a woman to be feminine and submissive rather than her to dominate you, you want her to be submissive to you. That means that if she is full of feminine energy, she can only be totally attracted to and in love with a man who displays perfect masculine energy. When you show weakness and emotions and you cry and stuff, you're showing to her that you are not that perfect masculine man, which is fine for a little bit. Like it can happen. Sometimes you can complain without realizing sometimes you can just cry a little bit because some bad shit's happened that's fine but if you start to do this consistently if you start to act like a little bitch and you're burying your head in her breast and ask her like oh you know she's oh she's wiping away the tears and this happens often she will lose respect for you this is seen as evil advice but it's the true advice the evil advice is the one telling you to ruin your relationship right now you may disagree go and ask any guy who's actually done this and he'll tell you the exact same thing consciously and in the real world she was so nice and so happy that she opened up and slowly and surely within a month two months their relationship ended Conveniently, just coincidentally, maximum two months for every guy who ever opens up to his girlfriend. About two months later, either the relationship ends or she's cheating on the side. This is not to tell you to never speak about your problems. Again, because people will say, oh, he's telling people to bottle up and that leads to suicide. No, no, no. This is not to tell you to (laughs) bottle up your emotions. This is telling you to choose a different person to be emotional in front of. Because there is a person you can do which will actually be useful and that is a male friend. But to your woman, as much as she says that she'd love for you to open up, she truthfully, subconsciously doesn't want to hear hear your problems. Why? Because she believes that you are that man. If she's in love with you and she's allowing you to fuck her or, you know, soon to be there, if she's in love with you, she has this perception of you that you are that guy, that you are the guy that can solve any challenge, no problem, that you will get it done, that you will bear the stress on your shoulders. She thinks of you highly. Why would you ruin that? Why would you show her? Oh, by the way, you know, this image that you had of me while I was like Superman and I could do all these things. I'm struggling, baby. I'm really struggling. I'm really what sad. It's really That's hard. Of life really hard it seems evil to say this it really seems uh, wrong to say this all right relation- <laughs> i love the weakness shirt we need to get those <laughs> oh. like the guy's like wearing a weakness shirt and he's all like sad. weakness super emo dude there, there there's a lot of shit there. there there's the one thing where it's like he he, he mentioned the uh if she, if she already sees you as like this superman who can handle any type of burden etc why would you mm. want to um why would you want to mess with that image Ah, uh, like as much as that's the man I'd like to be, mm. I can't be the man who can handle all burdens all the time, all the fucking time. Yeah. I can't, I, I can try, but I can't. And I, I can understand telling you to open up to your homies. Cause again, like we just mentioned, you can't open up to the person you're with about everything all the time and be a burden. But if I felt that I could never talk to the woman yeah. I'm with about 
anything all the time or else she'd lose her attraction to me and my Superman image would go away. That That's not healthy, dog. <laughs> like, some might, some might call me a bitch for that, but that's not healthy. <laughs> no, it kind of means that you also like barely got her too, right? And you don't want to be in that situation where they, you know, the second that you uh, are slightly different, they get rid of you, you know? So, Or they cheat on you on yeah. the side, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, you got to keep in mind too, it sounds like most of the time this guy's usually talking about like dating, which is different than like being with somebody for a mm -hmm. long time. Um, you know, when you're with somebody for a long time, I think things are way different. You start to learn the other person. You learn uh, what's easier to communicate with someone about. You learn when. You learn like when it's easier. To, you know, is it good for me to start out the day like communicating this to my spouse or should I maybe wait till they're in a better mood and I can communicate about the thing I'm frustrated about and uh, we can have like a more logical conversation rather than both of us getting frustrated. Um, so I think, you know, in this case, he's talking a lot about dating which is which is way different. But I also think that if you have to think about the way that you act and the way that you are, um, I think that you're trying to be with somebody and I don't think that's ever a good idea. Mm. I don't think try I don't you shouldn't have to try. Should be like things should go along pretty smoothly. And if you're someone who is cuz with what with what we do and and like our mindset we're always thinking of ways that we can improve ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like the, the self-improvement aspect of us doesn't really stop. But if, if you find that you need to hold this type of facade around the woman you're with so she can't see how you maybe feel or how you are, um, that's, uh, if, if, again, if that's someone you're serious about and you want to spend, if you want to marry them, like, hmm, that, it, it's hard to not let you not not show yourself to them mm. or not feel that you can be vulnerable with them and when we, when i use the word vulnerable again it's not like you have to cry in their bosom like he mentioned or <laughs> or fucking like be this sad piece of shit it's just like you got something going on do you you, you mm. don't feel comfortable enough to tell tell your significant other and if you feel more comfortable telling your homies tell your homies that's fine because maybe maybe that's the way but like you'll spend a lot of time with this person. You may be having children with this person. They're going to be a, probably closer to you than your male friends, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it just seems odd to me that you, you, that, that you can't do that, you know? And again, I'm not talking about sharing every single problem all the fucking time. It's a very different type of thing. But, I mean, you've been with Andy how long? A long ass time. I think uh, <laughs> 20... Uh, 23 years. Yeah. Married for 23 years. Married for 23 years. Would you say that she knows you better than almost anybody? Yeah. Yeah, she does. She knows me better than anybody. Better than anybody. Yeah. That's kind of a goal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's a goal. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I don't know. It seems almost like um, it's, it's a, it, it's a, sign or form of weakness if you can't truly be yourself around this person that you do want to spend the rest of your life with or at least i don't know the foreseeable future and you're kind of always putting up this fake person and so it's like well shit dude does she really like you and you don't know because you're not willing to actually open up to see if she does like you so then yeah i just feel like it's kind of almost weak doing that way as well or doing it that way as well there's a happy medium to this shit man mm -hmm. yeah but definitely and i i think you know, what he's pointing out, you know, saying like she views you as a Superman. I think that's cool. You know, I think that's great if they, if someone views you as uh, the masculine energy or views you in a certain light. I think yeah. All that's cool. But I don't, again, I don't think, I think once you get in a position of uh, having to try to figure out, having to try to figure out how to like stay with somebody, I think you might be in a, I think you might, I'm not talking about marriage because marriage is different, but if you're just dating somebody and you're really tr trying to figure it out, I don't. I, I think once you get into trying, I think you're just in the you're in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. You're in the wrong you're place with the, with the wrong person. There shouldn't be any trying. You shouldn't have to try to make the person like you more by acting any kind of way. They either like you or they don't, mm -hmm. and you'll either be with them for a long time or you won't be. Mm -hmm. But you can't. You might be able to prolong it. Might be able to stretch it out further, but that's worse. You know, being with someone for uh, two or three years is worse than being with someone for six months. Like six months would be great. You figured it out in six months that, ah, look, it's not going to work. 
you're probably both hurting afterwards. Probably some tears are shed or something like that, but probably not that bad. Mm -hmm. Two or three years, like that's a lot harder. You probably moved in with each other and um, it probably takes a lot more to recover from, but it really somewhere along the line, someone was like trying to make something work that just wasn't there anyway. Mm -hmm. See if we can bring yeah. up a clip of Jordan Peterson. <laughs> It's like sad to think about that people don't have like hardly. I mean, there's some people that don't have any encouragement. Yeah, that's uh, that's brutal. I don't usually say that things like make me sad, but the sound of that even makes me sad. Mm -hmm. Like that just sucks. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is like it is a reality. I don't know really. I think you know social media um, is something that has allowed people to express so many different ideas and so many different things to each other that maybe. Um, we weren't sharing before things get shared a lot faster yeah and a lot of people are sharing you know maybe maybe men shouldn't have shared you know how how sad we are how sad they are um maybe it would may i don't know it's hard to say like are we better off with some of those suppressed feelings like is a parent you know i, I didn't really see my dad cry i think i uh, you know i saw him cry like twice I think maybe even just once, I guess I saw him cry. Like I've seen him cry twice. He cried when my brother died and he cried when my mother died. And like more recently because he's older, he gets a pass. Cause I'm just thinking like maybe testosterone levels have gone down and estrogen starting to take <laughs> over. So, uh, he gets a pass. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier to be emotional when you're 75, you know, than, than when you're in your thirties and forties and stuff. But yeah, I don't really remember, um, see him cry when I was young, but I think even if I did see him cry, I don't think it would have made me think any less of him. Um, I think the things that uh, made me rethink the way that he acted was mainly just seeing anger. And he wasn't an anger. I hope I'm not painting the wrong picture here. He wasn't an angry guy, but every once in a while I'd be frustrated and I would see the anger result in something that was like, that's not great. Like, I don't want to do that. Cause I don't, I'm, I just, I'm like half scared of like confrontation and sh I don't like loud shit. I don't, you know, if, if people are going to like fight in the street or some shit, like I don't like any of that stuff. I hate it. I'd rather just not be, I'd rather not, I'd just rather not happen, you know? Um, so yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, I always kind of looked at like, uh, when I'm older, I'm going to see if I could maybe do something different with that energy, you know? Mm. Let me ask you guys this. Let me ask you guys this. When you were growing up and you guys like, you know, you're paying attention to what your, your your dads would do. When you were in maybe in your like your teenage years, your your twenties, did you did you actively model things after what you saw your fathers do? Or do you feel like it was a more passive thing? I, I asked this question because like Obviously, it was my mom. Like, my dad was there for a little bit. It was my mom. My mom, like, uh, put me on teams. So I had coaches. I had teachers who I looked up to. Um, fucking hell. Like, I think there's a reason why I watched so much Dragon Ball Z and, like, cartoons mm. with male protagonists because there was probably an aspect of me that was just, like, looking for that. And I know there was, right? Obviously, I read the Bible a lot. So, like, my, my, my ideas growing up of men were always these idealistic things. Mm. And I took some of that. But when I got into my early 20s and I started thinking about like my reactions to things um, and the way I handled things, there was always, uh, I, was, I was super cold in my early 20s. I'd never showed shit. And I had to like learn to model the type of ideal that I thought w I wanted to be in the back of my head. I didn't necessarily have a model. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious from you guys, have you, have you ever thought of that? Have you looked at that or, or paid attention to that? I think it just, I think it's almost like automatic. I think I followed in my dad's footsteps uh, quite a bit. Um, I always admired my dad and my grandfather and just always thought it was cool how both of them uh, were so into family mm -hmm. and uh, both of them were so, um, both of them weren't afraid to have, to show some emotion here and there. Not necessarily like, crying again like i just haven't seen a lot of 
crying, but I remember, you know, seeing my grandfather, you know, kiss my grandmother. I remember seeing my dad, my dad would like smooch my mom on the couch. Like I remember him like mm-hmm. doing that. Like he would get down on his knees and he'd like, my mom would be like lying on the couch and he would like tickle her or mess with her. Like I remember that from when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I always thought that's like, you know, I wasn't like the kid that thought it was gross. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, ah, oh, you guys are gross. <laughs> I always thought it was like adorable. I'm like, that's kind of mm-hmm. cute. And I'm like, my dad, you know, he's, one minute he's like yelling at me to do something, and the next minute he's like doing that. It's kinda, That's got game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my dad's always was always very happy too, and I always admired that. And my grandfather was always very happy. Both of them, uh, they not only like loved being happy, but they would go out of their way to try to figure out how to make something happy and fun. Mm. Uh, whether it be like trying to play a game or just organize people getting together. Uh, so those were things that I saw at a young age that I wanted to do, but. Having said that, I wanted to do everything else the opposite of my dad. I saw my dad in a suit and tie every day, and I'm like, I ain't doing that. Whatever that is, I'm not doing that. You know, he is in a suit and tie every day, and he's gone, like, seems really early in the morning. And then he's not back until really late. And then we eat dinner together, and then he does the same thing the next day. I'm like, I ain't doing that shit, whatever that's called. Yeah. And he would say, it's called work. <laughs> like, What? But yeah, everything else kind of just ended up modeling a lot of it, I guess. It is. Andrew, I know you're about to get to what you mm-hmm. said, but like the funny thing is uh, what you said there, like from a very early age, one thing is like I told myself that I didn't want to, because uh, I, I I knew my dad for a period when I was younger, um, had visited him a few weekends and I stopped seeing him when I was a teenager. Uh, but one thing I always told myself is because I, I, I told myself I wanted to be the opposite. Right. Mm-hmm. So I had this ideal and the ideal was opposite of many aspects of he had. And he don't, don't get like one thing about my dad is that like we talk every now and then via WhatsApp. He lives in Nigeria. Um, he's a very smart individual. He was a very funny guy. Uh, but there's just, I guess, certain things that uh, I just knew that I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to deal with divorce. I didn't want to be in uh, a relationship where I mistreated somebody. Like there are these things where I was just like, I won't be that mm. because I saw what it caused. But I also think there is a negative aspect to that because there are many things about him that are pretty good. But my early years, there was a lot of resentment. So it 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 uh, when I look at how I was in my early 20s, there's a lot of things that were just like, damn, I, I shouldn't have like, like even in in relationships in my early 20s, there are certain things that I dealt with that I was just like, yo, as a man, that's not something you should deal with in a relationship. Mm-hmm. But because I was so like, I'm not going to be like my dad and leave a woman or this or that, I dealt with a lot of stupidity mm-hmm. because of my overcommitment to being such a good guy. <laughs> See what I mean? <clears throat> so yeah. it's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. I just remember um, my dad like never taking a day off of work. He mm-hmm. could be like super sick, throwing up on his way out. Like, no, nope, uh, I'll be back. I'm, I'm fine. And I just remember almost being jealous of that because yeah. I'd be like, dude, I don't have that. Like, shit, of all the things that maybe might have gotten passed down, I didn't get that at all. Yeah. Like, I stubbed my toe, don't even want to go to yeah, school. Yeah, like, I fucking, <laughs> yeah, I look for any excuse to get out of school. It was like, oh, shit, anything but Mondays, like, please, no. You know? <laughs> like, I did not want to work on anything, but it's because he, wor- he he found what he was passionate about. Yeah. And then, so, like, later on, once I, you know, got into photography and stuff, I was just like, oh, now it makes sense. You know, he, he never he never took a day off because he loved to do it. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, I mean, yes, it was work, and he would get beat up, and, you know, yeah, uh, like, his body would get banged up, and it still is to this day. And the pay was not, like, it was crazy, like, learning, like, he's like, yeah, I never really made that much money. I'm like, what? Like, then why did you work so hard? And it's because he loved it. Yeah. You know, and so, like, when I was a kid, I just remember being like, shit, if I can be, like, a quarter of that, like, that'd be great. Mm. And so that's just something that, like, you know, I guess passively or I I recognize it, but I never thought I'd actually be that. And then now, like, once I had an opportunity, it was like, oh, shit, like, like yeah let's let's open up the floodgates like let's keep going you know and so like now i think that's that's probably where i got my work ethic from Mm -hmm. yeah uh back to the uh opposite thing i i remember it was uh set on chris williamson's show he um i don't remember what guest he had on there but they talked about the opposite or maybe you know it was the first time he was on rogan okay when he talked about it and he talked about like an opposite hero and i Mm. thought that was really interesting because my brother was that way you know just watching 
uh, what he did and, you know, he had a drug addiction and stuff and just watching all that. I was like, it's some of the other stuff he did was cool. I was like, I like a lot of that stuff, but, um, I want to be the opposite in a bunch of other ways. Cause what he's doing just seems to be destructive for him. seems to hurt the family. It just, it's just a lot. And I, I don't know how much control he had over it. He had mental illness along with drug addiction. So I don't think he was actively like, uh, I don't think he, I don't think anybody wants to be that way. Mm -hmm. I think some, sometimes people just unfortunately end up that way. Uh, but for me to see that at a young age, I, it was, had a big impact on me. And I was just like, I want to try to figure out to avoid that whatever way I can. So drugs, like don't fuck with them. Yep. <laughs> you know, maybe when you get older, you can like learn more about them or something. But for now, since you don't know shit about them, don't go anywhere near them. Mm hmm. At this point, nasal breathing while you're asleep is no longer something that just us bros do, but people are realizing that it can make a big difference in your sleep quality, your recovery, and all aspects of sleep. That's why hostage tape is so important because many people have their mouths drop open while they're asleep, they're snoring, and that really affects the quality of their sleep. And that's why many wake up groggy and not feeling extremely rested. Hostage tape will allow you to tape your mouth shut even if you have a beard. Us bearded folks can put the tape on and can be confident enough that when you wake up in the morning, the tape will still be on your mouth, which will help you breathe through your nose. And they also have no strips if you're someone who struggles breathing through the nose. Those nose strips will help you open up your airway and breathe a little bit easier while you're asleep. How can they get their hands on some hostage tape? Yeah, you guys can head over to hostagetape.com slash power project where you guys can receive mouth tape and no strips for an entire year for less than a dollar a night. Again, hostagetape.com slash power project links down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah, it's, it's I think it's interesting, the, the whole opposite thing, because I mean, you can look at not having somebody or having a parent or that that made some bad decisions. You could look at that as negative or that could be something that ends up being a positive for you if you don't repeat those actions. Because a lot of people talk about like the, you know, Andrew, you mentioned like the generational repetition of certain types of actions or habits. But if you saw that those habits or those actions had a negative outcome for that mm -hmm. individual, you can actively tell yourself and actively make the decision not to do that thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it, it's a it's an easy decision to make rather than just saying oh this bad thing happened to me or this bad person happened it's like well just make the opposite decision of what they've done move in that direction yeah it, it makes something else better bigger than whatever it was that caused you to feel that way that's how i look at mm -hmm. it like is my son's future way more important than whatever it is i'm dealing with it's like yeah absolutely now you have something um I don't want to say reward, but like, um, you know, it's, it's almost like a, oh, like a, like a 30 day challenge to lose weight. It's like, okay, that's cool. But like, what if you, you know, just, this is not your lifestyle and you're never going to have to worry about like a hospital bill or something. It's like, oh shit, mm -hmm. like this is way bigger than what I thought it was. It does appear like, uh, I know people have talked about how in a lifetime we used to maybe only know approximately 150 mm -hmm. people. And now you, you know, just have so much interaction um, I wonder, you know, in the course of a day, the emotions that we go through uh, are probably way faster and way more rampant than ever before. Yeah. And I think things like social media can like, they can, for some people, cause some sadness, cause some like loneliness, make people feel isolated. They don't, they don't have to, it doesn't have to always result in that. But I think that, I think it's normal to see an image and to hear a dialogue and then be moved by that image and by that dialogue and to have it happen over and over again by scrolling, uh, whether it's uh, happy or sad or mad or, oh, look, these are these cute little puppies on here. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, this, I can't believe this guy's, you know, trying to run for president. And you go the next thing and it's like, oh, I can't believe that guy thinks that the guy's an asshole. And then the next thing is puppies again or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of go back and forth between seeing all these different things that um, – Almost like your own thoughts, you know, you don't always have control over the thought that randomly hits you in the shower or you don't have a thought. Like if I say giant pink dildo, you automatically have to think about the giant pink dildo, at least for mine half a second. spikes. Ooh. For some reason, mine had spikes Yours on has it. spikes on Pleasure it. Like spikes. That. How many? Yeah. Oh, a bunch? Probably. Ribbed. <laughs> but you don't always have, you don't have, always have control. And when you're scrolling, you know, it's not like you, 
okay, we have like an algorithm or some so, something or someone is trying to hit us with certain messages, but you don't have control over what that next one is. Mm. And you're while you might want to interpret everything as being like fun or happy or keeping you in a good mood, there's probably some stuff that's coming across that's ma- making you not feel so great. And so I think in this time and this day and age is really more important than ever to try to really double down on the things that you think make you feel good. And you have to really, I think it's important that people learn and they cut out and carve out a little bit of time to be with themselves and they learn how to be with themselves and they learn how when they're by them, just because they're by themselves and just because there's not a lot of noise and a lot of shit going on, doesn't mean that you're have to, doesn't, that doesn't mean you have to be lonely in that moment. And instead, maybe you can choose uh, a walk. Maybe you can choose to go outside and just sit in a chair and relax, get some sunlight. You can go on a run, go on a bike, do some exercise. Um, they say that, uh, <clears throat> they say that people that feel really lonely when they're, by, when they're by themselves, it's because they're in bad company. So try to be in good company. Try to mm. figure out what, how can you make yourself feel good? How can you feel better? And uh, the way I do it is I just, I just fill in. I stuff all my emotions down all the time. I suppress them, my sadness, my madness. And I just keep training and training and training and training. Mm-hmm. And I learned this from David Goggins. So let's see if we can bring up this. Uh, I'm kidding about that, but let's see if we can bring up this clip from David Goggins, even though it's absolutely insane how much the guy trains. Um, I think trying to find some solidarity in uh, being by yourself a little bit can be really beneficial for a lot of people. So what's your training entail? Well, since I have a full-time job, um, I get up about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning, and I work out until about 8. And that's what they be at work. I go to work from about 8 until about um, six o'clock and then I bike, bike back home. So I'm on the bike anywhere from four to eight hours a day. And if I'm running, I'm running anywhere between 100 to 150 miles a week. So that's basically what I do. And I also hit the weights about three or four times a week because it's important also, weight training also. But I didn't start doing this until about November of 2005. I used to weigh 290 pounds and um, I just started doing this 2005. So now you're kind of addicted to it in a way. Not addicted to it at all. <laughs> no. I do it to raise money for a foundation. Oh, I didn't know that. So this is why I I, I, I do this. So what's your treat? <laughs> addicted, huh? <laughs> I mean, if, if we're going to be real, though, it's like if there's anything, it's, it's probably not the worst to be addicted to mm-hmm. making your body feel mm-hmm. good. But it is kind of funny how like someone who does as much as that or even someone like yourself or even you andrew if you tell somebody like what you do in terms of exercise or, or what you do to you know your nutrition they're just going to automatically give you the thing oh so so why are you so addicted to it or why why do you feel so you don't like to have fun do you <laughs> even, well yeah why don't you like to have fun and it's like these things allow us to feel good mm. pretty much all the time Right, these outlets. Yeah. I think there's, as, as I was saying, I think there's a huge difference between mental health and mental illness. Some of these things we are, you know, doing because we recognize that it brushes up against it. It hygienes our mental health. It's hygiene for our mental health. Mm-hmm. And I really am a huge believer that, and um, I'm hearing more people talk about this recently, but I'm a huge believer that you get to the mental side of things through the physical and the physical side of things through the mental and I, I think that that's just the way the body works. And I, th- I think that it has to be, your body has to be taxed in some way. You, you have to, there's just no free lunch. Um, you guys both have pets as well. And you guys know that your dog needs to be walked, man. Your dog, ha- it has to, your dog has to be active. And it's like abusive to not have the dog get an activity. Like oh, it yeah. kind of is. It's like sad, you know, the dog... The dog isn't the same dog anymore. If it doesn't get its steps in, if it doesn't get its activity in. And a human being, like as much as we want to try to pretend that we're not uh, animals or animalistic, we are, you know. Uh, we, you know, we just try to cover it up as much as we can so that we don't uh, seem weird or smell weird or, <laughs> or, or act too, uh, uh, too animalistic in certain situations. But 
uh, I think it's just, it's part of our nature. It's part of like what we are and who we are. And I think that, uh, I think that, you know, you, you have to have a certain amount of movement every single day and getting that movement, I personally believe really helps you to stay mentally stable and mentally strong. Mm -hmm. I notice that easily with myself. I, I think everybody, if you, if you kind of pay attention to the days where you do feel the best and maybe the days where you're not feeling all together, there might also be kind of like a, a corollary thing to how much you manage to move or how much sun you manage to get, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I know that for a fact. And that's why the habit of physical activity has been such a staple for me since I've been a teenager. Um, because I always notice whenever something falls off or whenever I don't do the things I need to do physically, I start to feel a bit of a cloud mentally. And then I deal with that cloud physically. <laughs> and then the cloud goes away. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, it, it, but, and, and some people yeah, I've seen, especially on social media, and it's a, it's a thing that I see a lot of women comment when guys are talking about this, because I understand that it's like some guys say the gym is my therapy, this and that. But for some people, it very well can be your therapy. I, I hate it so fucking cringy. It's so fucking cringy. Oh, jujitsu is my therapy. But I can say I feel really good after, and I feel really clear headed. Same thing when I get like my gym the, session in. The difference though for you versus someone that's like maybe nineteen or something like that. Um, at least it appears that you work through your other stuff outside of just going to jujitsu and just like raging on people in jujitsu. <laughs> True. You're not just going to the gym <laughs> and you're not just like lifting like an animal and you're yeah. not going to jujitsu and killing everybody. Uh, you are doing those things in th some ways, but mm -hmm. you're also reading books. You're also listening to podcasts. You're further developing yourself in a bunch of different ways at the same time. And yes. And all of us are here too. Like the, get the gym, Jiu-jitsu isn't the only thing we use for our mental health, but at the same time, I would say it's a huge part of it. If if that wasn't there, I'm, I'm going to speak for myself. If I didn't have physical exercise as far as the gym or if I didn't have something like jujitsu, I know that my mental health would not be as good as it currently mm -hmm. is. Um, it, it, it wouldn't be. Right. So that's why it's such a staple for me, because it does then allow me to deal with the other things I need to deal with in a much better way healthier fashion in a much much less aggressive fashion than maybe I would if I didn't have those types of outlets. And when I say jujitsu as an outlet, I am not going to jujitsu and taking out rage and anger on people. I'm not hurting people at jujitsu. But physically, it is an outlet. There's a little pile of people in the corner <laughs> <laughs> that didn't seem a beat to death. <laughs> but it, it, it's a great physical outlet. And on the other side of things, it's a, it's a great community type of thing mm -hmm. where it's like you go, you roll with people, you talk with people, you hang out with people. It's like it's a, it's an, it's a great form of community too. So I'm getting right. a double whammy of health right there. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the best things you can do if you're bummed or not feeling great about a day is to be around other people. Oh, yeah. Because, like, I don't know, maybe this one guy over here, maybe he annoys you, and you're like, oh, fuck, <laughs> my day already sucks, and now i got to run into him. But then you run into the other guy that brings you up, and the two guys say, hey, let's do this together. And you're like, all right, fuck mm -hmm. it. And do it half-heartedly, and next thing you know, you're in it. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're, like, totally fine. It's almost like you're... Uh, in that moment, you were, like, bipolar. Like, you were <laughs> not doing great one moment, and next minute... For some reason, you're totally fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the uh, I, when you mentioned like the memes and stuff about therapy, it's like uh, there's some really good ones. But yeah, like dudes will do X, Y, and Z when they could just go to therapy. It's like they will, you know, go to the gym. They'll go get choked out in jujitsu or whatever instead of just going to therapy. Maybe that's better. <laughs> but what I was gonna ask you guys is, um, what about like a like a mental win? Like, let's say. I don't know, somebody at their job, they get a huge promotion, they get something, like whatever it may be, like they, they just finished all their work for the day and they feel really, really good. That's a form of like a high or like, like oh, yeah, I accompl accomplishments. There we go. How does that stack up to like the physical side of things, like the physical wins throughout the day versus like, yeah, like getting stuff accomplished? Accomplishment feels great. I think it, it can... Uh it can it can rival the feel of like uh, doing something physically. I think within the physical, there's sometimes there's accomplishment too, where you did something new or you did something slightly different or you did something slightly better than last time. Um, 
But getting praise from somebody else and getting praise from like a mentor or someone at work, um, as Jordan Peterson was saying, like, fuck, man, getting encouragement, having someone tell you they did a great job or they're super proud of you or excited for you. It's like, man, having someone tell you that they're proud of you is like, that's unbelievable sometimes. Mm -hmm. So those things can, uh, those things are really neat because they can kind of, uh, they can last for a little while. Like that's something that, you get a raise at work and they make a big deal and they tell everybody else like, Hey, this guy's doing such a good job. This is what we're looking for. And you get a bump in pay and everything. Like you might feel really good about that for like a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Might feel really good about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, but like, so yeah, I guess that answers the question. Like, you know, it, it can be therapeutic also. Mm -hmm. Right. But you probably aren't going to see those as often as you would as yeah. hitting the gym. Yeah, I just think I agree with Ensema, like the balance of my uh, mentality and the balance of my mental health uh, would be way harder for me to juggle um, if I wasn't like so physically active. Mm -hmm. Being physically active, you know, it gives you something to do. It, it ha you know, they talk about when someone has like a lot of anxiety, when someone's real anxious, they move around a lot. Like they just, they talk, they talk with their hands, they move around a lot. What are they trying to do? They're trying to work it out. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And that's why we work out. You know, mm -hmm. an interesting thing that kind of just hit me, Andrew, is um, it's kind of like from, from what you were just saying, when, when it comes to like the physical side of things, whether it's uh, the gym, running, jujitsu, these are all, these are kind of all artificial wins, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, when you lift a little bit heavier weight or do one extra rep it's an artificial win you know like it's something it's a challenge that you made for yourself on a daily basis uh, but it's still a win right mm -hmm. um whereas these things on the outside where it's like oh i got a win at work or this new company is the company that i'm working with or this or that these are wins but these are wins that they're a culmination of the work that you've managed to put in over a period of time, but it's not like they happen every single day. So if you don't have any things that you're doing artificially for yourself to give you wins, then you're always waiting for a win from coming from an outside mm. telling you you've done something good rather than you doing something that's like, I fucking did that. And it doesn't even need to be super physical. I know we talk about this stuff because we fucking love it and makes us feel good. But think about something like starting something creative, like guitar or, or instrument or fuck, you know, you, you, you started some type of new book, right? And you, you got another chapter done or you, you, you learned something new, right? These are all wins that you're giving yourself to help you feel better about yourself. You're getting smarter. You're getting stronger. You're getting better at something. And these are all things within your control, not your boss telling you you did something great. As good as that feels, mm -hmm. a friend or a boss, yeah. But when you know you did that, mm -hmm. that feels really good, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and that's something I definitely didn't do a lot of before I came to super training. So like I was always waiting for somebody else to to tell me I'm doing a good job or I'm being a good boy. Um, <sighs> but, yeah. but setting up those, those, they, yes, they are made up. So you're going to get a made up medal for it. <laughs> but yeah. I think that's super important. And, and I, I wish I did that, you know, a younger version of myself did more of that, you know, because I, I never rewarded myself for anything. Cause I'm like, Oh great. I you know went to work again today. <laughs> like it's like, I don't know. I could have made something fun out of it. Or even like, you know, so many people are trying to stick to their nutrition. When, when you set a goal, as far as that's concerned and you have a good day, you won right you you don't need, you, you you won yeah and then that's a good thing now can you win consistently because then that adds up too as far mm -hmm. as you feeling better yeah you won instead of oh i didn't lose the amount of weight i wanted yeah um i saw a clip and it was uh from the guy that i sent you who does those uh really crazy mobility drills um he does like that oh, yeah. dragon tail thing or some shit that oh. he does and does all this wild stuff. But anyway, this guy explained stuff. He, he took these, uh, he kept like filling up stuff with water. And uh, he said, instead of just basically, instead of having a minimum, have a maximum each day. Today, like you're only allowing yourself, like you, you, you have like a maximum uh, amount of stuff to do in a day. If you, he said, if you give yourself mm -hmm. like a minimum and you don't, you don't do, <laughs> you don't even do the minimum, you feel like shit. Mm -hmm. but he has like a ceiling on like how much work that he doesn't want to do for the day. So he's coming from it from a slightly different angle. Um, 
So like the maximum amount of exercise in a day would be that you go to the gym uh, and you went to jujitsu for the day. But if he can even fill that cup up at all, you know, as long he he just doesn't want to go over the maximum. Is that one? Yeah, it's that guy. Okay, uh, it's but see if you can find. See that. if you can find. Yeah, maybe it's that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, this guy's great. I just saw him the other day too. He this guy's is, incredible. Like his mobility is stupid. He moves so well. What the fuck? <laughs> he's like talk, hell. Yeah, he's like talking as he's like doing these movements. I'm like, oh my god, I wouldn't yeah. be able to breathe. <laughs> oh, where's the sound? Son of a bitch. <laughs> Sorry, it's I. Right. Where is it? Fucker. Yeah, this is a cool yeah. analogy. And then they, like whatever he's pouring, I'm like, is he gonna make something? Is he gonna make coffee for mm -hmm. What's going on here? Okay. What's that guy's name? God, John Yuan. In the back of our minds, that there's a minimum of work that needs to be done. Like a good workout needs to be at least 45 minutes. And we need to do at least X amount of sets of X amount of exercises. Now holding ourselves to this kind of standard is admirable. But it pays to keep in mind that we don't directly benefit from our standards. We benefit from our actions. And if our standard for a good enough workout gets in the way of us working out on a day, then it's a bad standard on that day. Unfortunately, we tend not to blame our standards. Instead, we blame ourselves, which honestly doesn't seem that productive. On those days, I flip the script. Instead of giving myself a minimum of work to do, I give myself a maximum. Mm -hmm. A time, a number of sets, a number of reps, a number of exercises that I'm not allowed to exceed. So why do this? Well, giving yourself a maximum of, say, time or exercises makes it easier to start the workout. Because you know you have more opportunities to stop when you need to. More opportunities to stop. <laughs> that's fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Damn, that was... That's what I did with running. It's huge help. You know, so people that are looking to try to get started with running, give yourself an opportunity to stop. Like, give yourself permission to stop. Um, let's say you want to just, you're like, okay, I want to actually, you know, get like two miles in today. Two miles, whatever way you can do it. You don't need to run the entire time. Maybe you walk and jog back and forth. Give yourself an opportunity to stop. Tie your shoes, drink some water. Like, just really take your time. And if you if you say, I'm going to give myself an hour to go two miles, <laughs> that's like so much time. That's so much time for you to for you to accomplish something like that. So you'll have, you'll be able to check that off the list rather than, um, it being like a negative where you didn't go and do anything for the day. Mm, I got nothing to add to that. That I, I want to say though, his content's really cool because he does the opposite approach to what most people do in terms of content. He has no music in the background. Thank goodness. Has space between every single sentence and he just speaks. That's and so it's good. just, it's, 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 it's he does it so well. He does it so well. Like, Good job, John. Yeah. Knowing my dumb ass, though, like using, like, say the two mile thing, I'm like, this is the maximum. Mm. If I don't hit the maximum, mm -hmm. I'm going to be like, I failed. <laughs> I picked a wrong maximum today. I should have picked yeah. a whatever different. So I, I would have to uh, tinker with that a little bit. Mm. The, the thing that I like, the thing that I don't think we realize is though how much a little bit each day does add up. And we've talked about the microdosing thing so much. But if people start to put it into practice, they'd realize how fast certain things will start. You'll start to make progress with certain things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you're someone who's trying to get better at pull-ups or dips or something, rather than it being something that you do two to three times a week and you have your multiple sets, if you had something where you could just hit three a day, hit four a day, you'd realize, well, wow, you're getting really good at this really quickly by just attacking it one minute a day or doing one or two sets each day. Like it, it, it's crazy, but it it really doesn't take as much as we think. But the way most most of us set things up is we have like our fifty minutes, ninety minutes in the gym, this and that, and and then when you fall off, you fall off because you can't maintain that ninety minutes. So it's it's the microdosing concept right there. I was just talking with uh, Jesse Burdick, and he was mentioning how people um, they won't go into their sauna because it's not above one sixty. <laughs> They won't go into their cold plunge. It's not cold enough or, yeah. or they don't have access and they, I don't have a cold plunge, so I'm not going to even do it. And I'm not even going to have cold therapy in the shower. Yeah. 
Um, it's those kinds of mentalities that could really kind of unravel stuff. And then you just don't end up with any, you don't end up with any of the work. Um, oh, I, I can't spend, they, somebody said 35 minutes in the sun. I don't have 35 minutes. I only got three minutes. So I'm not going to do it at all. The three minutes still could be really beneficial. I've been really digging the cold plunge again. And, uh, you know, the cold plunge is something that I think you can get addicted to because of the dopamine and everything. And <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoy it. I love the way that it makes me feel. Um, but it's just not always, for me, it just doesn't always seem like it's in the cards for me to do it every day. I don't take it as a loss when I don't do it. But for today, I was like, you know what? It's pretty fucking cold out. And the sun's not even really out yet. So I went outside and I was cold outside while the sun was coming out. Went back inside, grabbed a coffee, went back outside. I'm just in my undies out there in my <laughs> front yard, probably looking like a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> like I was doing with the towel. The <laughs> you knew. I'm sorry, guys. I just the mic. <laughs> yeah, you can see you can show that clip. Please I gotta show you guys which this, one. Uh, sorry, go on his page. It's a towel. Oh, okay. Well, yep my towel my towel flipping. When I saw that, I was like, Mark, you really posted this shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. I've lost it. <laughs> it's over with. <sighs> but any amount, you know, any amount is some amount. This is the way I dry off after I go on the cold plunge. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry for the ears that I just made bleed. Oh, no. God. Look at that ass. <laughs> hey, now. You're, you're missing the voiceover, though, dude. My little doggy. Oh, my bad. My little puppy Man, dog out there with me. me today. Oh, Daisy's out there running around with you in the towel? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. This actually, I don't know why, why, but the this, towel. The science uh, behind it. Oh, it's a voiceover, voiceover. Yeah, with music and everything. Mm -hmm. We had to make it uh, theatrical. Mm-hmm. I think you guys could do this with your gi. Beat up your gi. I go outside. <laughs> I do some squats. I do some push Last the Mohicans. And I fight uh. against this giant beach towel. <laughs> <laughs> All while in the sunlight. This is to help warm me back up after getting freezing, freaking cold in the cold plunge. This is my way of thawing out. The reason why I do this, the science behind it is because it makes me feel really fucking good. That's why I do it. Not only does it make me feel good, but it helps me to feel awesome for about five or six hours afterwards. A power that I've never felt before from any supplement or any other thing I've ever taken or done. Catch you guys later. Still a midget. The <laughs> Hell yeah. So, so that's actually, the, you know, what you said at the end there is pretty wild because you've used a lot of supplements. Mm -hmm. You used a lot of stuff and Getting in the cold and doing that, it doesn't compare. Other things don't yeah. compare to that. It's amazing. I just think it's like, uh, it's something that you have no choice but to deal with it. Yeah. And I think when I think about exercising, like you can kind of like, you can kind of dog it. Like you don't have to always go so hard. Yeah. Um, you can work out the way that most people work out today where they're not really lifting anything. <laughs> <laughs> you can like drag a t drag a sled, do some knees over toes stuff, do some man bun stuff, smell some incense, play some weird music, Blow and you can some ropes. yeah, and you can head on out, right? And juggle um, a kettlebell. <laughs> but when it comes to the cold, it's just something you have to deal with. Oh, yeah. It probably you know I don't have as nearly as much experience as you guys with jujitsu, but probably very similar to like you know, this is real right now. Like this, this shit really hurts. You know, this guy's giving me this much fucking pressure. I'm in a lot of trouble. Mm. To me, the cold plunge is like just an immediate thing that you have no, you have a, you don't really have control over it. You can control how you react to it. You can control how you react to that water uh, from like a standpoint of how much noise you make, how much breathing you do. Um, but I mean, unless you're like Wim Hof, unless you have a lot of experience with it, mm. The cold's going to be the cold and it's going to make you feel cold. You know, you hear Rogan recently, he was like on a podcast. He's like, I'm sorry, I just got out of the cold plunge. And I, he's like, I'm still shivering. So if I sound weird right now, it's because I'm still freaking cold. So it makes you cold. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys, guys, cold plunges is not a joke. It feels amazing. It is a challenge to get into it every day, but it feels good. So again, you could take a cold shower. You will still feel the benefits of the cold, but if you want to get yourself a cold plunge, there's some stuff down below. They have a new plunge that is one unit without a chiller. Um, so it's pretty dope. doesn't take up much space, but if you want a cold plunge, get yourself a cold plunge. 
I like what you're sipping on. That's uh, that stuff's pretty good from uh, Chris Williamson and uh, yeah. James Smith. They did a great job. They made kind of like uh, I guess we'd say like an energy drink. It's a it's a, a nootropic. nootropic a nootropic drink. It has some caffeine in it, but it has this thing called Cognizin, Rhodiola, Fanic, Panix, L-theanine, and 120 milligrams of caffeine. Tastes good. Feels good. There you so, go. Yeah. That's all the time we got for today, folks. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, which I know you did because you got this far, then click this one right here because you'll enjoy this one just as much. And if you're choosing to still listen to me currently as I'm telling you to go over here and watch this video, well, hey, that just means you like the sound of my voice. <laughs> and well, I'll just keep seducing you right here. Hello.